up. Um, so today, I don't know why this didn't There we go. Wait, where's Tuesday's post? Oh, and maybe it didn't post it. Here we go. I'll post it now. So today is the 27th. We're going to be going over homework four. First in class, and then um, we'll be finishing your notes on stars. Your homework is stars homework assignment number two. It goes on Google Classroom, um, and you have a quiz tomorrow, so you should also be studying for that. I don't know why this is taking so long to post. There we go. There we go. Okay. Um, you have a quiz tomorrow. Today in lab, we'll be doing lab eight, characteristics of stars. You won't have to finish it today, but I'll have you finish the goals um, for homework if you don't finish what's in class. Uh, there is a quiz tomorrow, which I wrote here on the bottom, and it's going to be on that one note packet that you have. We'll finish it today, and then you'll have a quiz on it tomorrow. Um, are there any questions on anything like that before we get started? Okay. Um, so I know Mr. McNamara was supposed to come today, but I think he has to come on Friday instead. So we'll see him on Friday, which is fine either way. Let me just calibrate and then we can get started. Nice. <laughs> I'm sure he's very nice. Or is he mean? He's mean like me. What <laughs> Um, does anyone still need this up for copy? I'm the nicest teacher ever. Oh, I thank you. <laughs> That's what I like to hear. Sometimes I think I'm mean. I think I'm. I just have high expectations for like behavior and things like that. I don't think I'm necessarily mean. Um, okay. So take out your homework from last night. Let's go over this. Everyone should have it in front of them as we go over it, so that they can write things down. Um, that I write that will help you understand it better next time if you didn't get things correct. And we'll just take a look at how you guys did as well, like we normally do. The average is a 14.26 out of 17. So kind of on the low side for this one, I think one or two of the questions did trip people up. One and two look good. Three also looks good. Four does two. Five looks good. Six looks good. Seven looks pretty good as well. Eight. Nine, little little tricky uh, with the, I think, I guess, uh, choice D. Number 10, also people picked A. Um, on the second side, people got confused about main sequence versus red giant. There was two stars to pick for number 12, uh, 13, and 14 I went back to correct. And 15 looks like inverse, confused people, and 16 looks okay. So we'll go over these questions and we'll talk about them. Um, I guess at the beginning I'll, I'll use the actual homework to write on, but then I'm going to flip to the reference table. So it actually may help you to also have the reference table in front of you so that you can uh, kind of make sure you're looking at the reference table we've been talking about and you can find the answers. So have your homework out, but also have your reference table out. Is there anyone that was in here yesterday and doesn't have a question? Okay. All right, number one. Which process combines lighter elements into heavier elements and produces energy within the sun and other stars? Lighter element is hydrogen. So you're combining two hydrogens together. You're forming a heavier element, which is helium. And also energy is a byproduct. This formula is a formula for nuclear fusion, which is choice A. Number two, what are the two most abundant elements in a main sequence star? A main sequence star is just like our sun, and you have this graph. The hottest temperatures are over here on the left. 30,000 is the color blue. So the correct answer is A for number three. For four, compared with our sun, which is right here, the star Betelgeuse, which is over here, if since Betelgeuse is up toward the top, you know it's larger. As far as temperature, since it's on this side, if you look down here, these are cooler. 
and the luminosity has to do with the size. So the more high up you are on this graph, the more luminous you are. So the correct answer for this one is D. Okay, Betelgeuse is larger, cooler, and more luminous. Number five, which star is cooler and many times brighter than the Earth's sun? So here's the sun, and their choices are Barnard's star, which is down here, Betelgeuse, which we just looked at, Rigel, which is over here, and Sirius, which is right here. So here's our sun. So we need something that is brighter and cooler. So brighter, um, brighter means up here. So anything above here is brighter. So it can't be Barnard's star. And cooler has to be toward the cool temperature, so on this side. So it can't be Sirius or Rigel. So again, Betelgeuse is the answer for number five, which is B, because it's larger and cooler. Number six, which of the forces listed below is most responsible for the formation of stars? Well, yesterday we talked about two forces which are present in a star. Um, so we said gravity is what holds it together and fusion is what pushes out on a star. So these are your two forces. Since fusion isn't an option, it's gotta be gravity, which is choice A for number six. Yeah, what about that? Yeah, go ahead. Which two stars have the most similar luminosity and temperature? So luminosity is um, dependent on the size of the star. The larger the star, the more luminous it is. And temperature is here on the bottom. So you're looking for a star that they're close together, and they also are somewhat very close to each other on this graph. So the two closest stars together on this graph are the Sun and Alpha Centauri. They have the same exact temperature and color, and Alpha Centauri is just a little bit larger because it's sitting on top of the Sun, which also means it's a little bit more luminous as well. So for number seven, it's C. Okay, number eight. Compared to the temperature and luminosity of the star Polaris, the star Sirius is what? Okay, so Polaris is a giant star. It's more luminous, it's a bit larger, but it's also cooler. And so Sirius, being down here, is less luminous, and since it's to the left a little bit by these temperatures, it's hotter. So for eight, D is correct. Number nine. For number nine, you could have used exactly what it says in question one. That's an excellent example of using the test. A is correct. Lighter elements convert into heavier elements. Two hydrogens combine together to form a helium. Any questions on the front of your homework? Okay. Second page. Number 10. Compared to the surface temperature and luminosity of massive stars in the main sequence, what are the smaller stars like? So again, this is the main sequence. It's this stripe of stars that goes across your map. So compared to the mass of stars on the main sequence, which are these, what are the cooler stars like? Uh, or what the smaller stars like? So the smaller stars are down here. So if they're small, they're immediately less luminous. Um, and since they're all the way by the 2,000 and 3,000 Kelvin mark, we know they're cooler as well. So for number 10, C is correct. For number 11, the star Algol is estimated to have approximately the same luminosity as the star Aldebaran. Okay, so here's Aldebaran. The same luminosity would mean that this star Algol has a luminosity and size of about this height on our map. And it's approximately the same temperature as the star Rigel. So here's Rigel, and we said yesterday the temperature was about 11,000 Kelvin. So where these two stars touch right here, this would be the star Algol that they're referring to. And if you look, I already drew the box for the mean sequence, so you should see that this star is closest to the mean sequence, which is choice A for 11. Okay. Number 12. They want you to name a star with a temperature around 3,000 Kelvin. Okay, so 3,000 Kelvin starts down here and goes up to about here. This is 3,000 Kelvin. So I'm just going to draw my line straight down. Anything that's close to my line is about 3,000 Kelvin. So Barnard star is touching the line, and Betelgeuse is very close to it. This was not an option on the homework, so it has to be Barnard star or Betelgeuse. 
Okay, Proximus Centauri would also be an option, but these two are the better choices. Number 13, the smallest giant star. Okay, so here's your giants. The smallest main giant star would be the one that's closer to the bottom. Remember, the massive stars are at the top, the small ones are at the bottom, so Pollux, which was choice, uh, there is no multiple choice for this one. So this is your answer for 13. 14, generally the more large the star is, the more massive, the more luminous it is. Okay, so 14, I was looking for you to tell me luminous. I even took the words like bright, the brightness. Try to use the words that are on this diagram though. Luminosity, temperature, massive versus small. On the main sequence, okay, again, so this section here. The, um, as temperature increases, so as temperature starts low, and goes toward my higher numbers, what's happening to the luminosity? It's also increasing. So for number 15, it should be increasing. So when temperature increases, luminosity increases. Since they're both increasing at the same time, this is a direct relationship. Okay. And 16, why is Betelgeuse more luminous than Aldebaran? Betelgeuse is here, Aldebaran is down here, Betelgeuse is more luminous because it's more massive. Now. Any questions on using this page? Okay, you definitely will see questions just like this on the quiz. So if you got something wrong, don't check this homework in the garbage. Use it to study. It will help you. Okay? Take out your notes, please. And you also need a highlighter and a pencil. life cycle of stars. So we kind of talked a little bit about this yesterday. Um, and in general, when I see questions on this topic, they tend to have um, more background information in the question than just asking you to memorize these steps. So I'm giving you a lot of information to help you answer some of these questions. And today's really going to be more about reading comprehension and being able to go back in the passage, pull information out to answer the question. So this is somewhat like an English class, which in general, I think science really just is a nice mixture of English and math. That's what, and it's applied. That's what science is. And so today we're going to be practicing a little bit of English skills. Um, so I'm going to be highlighting important information and reading. You should be doing the same thing as well, because the highlighted information will help you pull out the information you need to answer the question. All stars start out as a nebula. A star's life cycle is determined by mass. The larger the mass, the shorter the life cycle. A nebula is a large cloud of gas and dust. The force of gravity pulls some of the gas and dust in a nebula together. The contracting cloud is then called a protostar. So a protostar is like a pre-star. So every, every star, no matter what the size is, starts out as a nebula. Before a star is called a star, it's called a protostar, a pre-star. It is the earliest stage of a star's life, besides the nebula stage. A star is only born when the gas and dust from a nebula becomes so hot that nuclear fusion starts. 
Once nuclear fusion starts, it is now a star. Just like we learned yesterday, nuclear fusion happens when light hydrogen atoms combine to create a heavier helium molecule. Once a star has turned on, it is known as a main sequence star. This is what our sun is right now. When a main sequence star begins to run out of hydrogen, the star becomes a red giant or a red supergiant, depending on the mass of the star. So that's how a star is born. All stars start out this way. Yes? What about the stars we see in the night sky stuff? Would they be multi main sequence? There's a whole bunch of different ones. Yeah, you could have main sequence, you could be seeing red giants, super giants. More than likely, all the stars that you see are so far away that they're super giants because they're just so big that you can see them from a great distance. Stars like our sun would be more difficult to see from afar because it's very tiny, okay? All right, so down here, I give you a nice little picture of each of these steps. So here's the nebula, the gas and dust that starts off with. And notice there's two tracks. You have a low mass star track and a high mass star track. And so the proto star is where you have that gas and dust starting to come together with the force of gravity. And once it gets hot enough inside that nucleus, inside that uh, kind of coalescing ball of gas and dust, the star begins to perform fusion. As soon as it does, it's a main sequence star. So that's what you see right here. Now, once the star runs out of that hydrogen fuel, which is so important for main sequence stars, it balloons out to become a giant or a supergiant, depending on how big the mass of the star was initially. So this is the beginning of the star's life, and now it's going to begin to die following that. Okay? So, let's see. Um, flip to the next page. And look at the very top of the page. So at the very top of the page, you'll see a sequence of what happens first, next, and you need to put these in order. I would use a pencil to do this. You can either remember what we just talked about, or you can be flipping back and forth and using the things you just highlighted to determine what happens first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. Okay? Use a pencil. You'll be happy you did. Michael, if you want to highlight what I highlighted.
what happens next okay so is there anyone that would like to start what is the first thing that happens John Carlo what do you think good that is number one nebula is where all stars begin what happens next after this what do you think Samantha. Good, perfect. So you have nebula, then your protostar. Okay, so now you have your protostar that needs to eventually form at the star itself. So what step comes next? Paul? Perfect. Yes, you need the gravity to pull that material in, causing this, the protostar itself to heat up until it's hot enough for nuclear fusion to take place. Good. Okay. So this next one describes the process of nuclear fusion. So what comes next? What did you get for the next one? Lily, what do you think? Um, hydrogen turns to two stars and they're able to combine the energy of the sun. Good. That is a description of fusion. Hydrogen atoms are the lighter element, fusing together to form helium, and it also generates a ton of energy, making it produce visible light, heat, and among other things. Okay? Um, and so, what is the next step? We currently have a main sequence star. What would be the next step of this star, do you think? Madison, what did you get for this one? Good, very nice. Okay, so after it runs out of fuel, and the fuel they're talking about is hydrogen gas, then it begins to kind of balloon out to form a red giant or a super giant. And then what happens next depends on the size of the star. Okay, questions on this? Okay, now let's keep reading. So flipping back to the front page, let's talk about star death. Very ominous. So now the death of a star has a lot to do with the mass of the star. They have two different tracks, as you kind of saw before. The beginning part of the star's life is pretty much the same, just one is bigger than the other the whole time. But the events that happen in the second part of the star's life are very different depending on if you have a high or low mass star. So we'll talk about our sun first. So our sun is a low mass star, so this is what's going to happen next. So after a low or medium mass star has become a red giant, the outer parts grow bigger and explode. So the outer parts grow bigger and explode. So this is like the sun's atmosphere. Out into space, forming a, a cloud of gas and dust called a planetary nebula. The blue white hot core of the star that is left behind cools and becomes a white dwarf. The white dwarf eventually runs out of fuel and dies as a black dwarf. This is the ultimate fate of our sun, to be a black dwarf star. And so I want to turn your attention back to your reference table for a quick second, because maybe you're noticing some of these things which we didn't really talk about before. So you have main sequence stars. This is where our sun is currently at. Okay, it's within this section of main sequence stars. The next step of our sun is which step? Now that you kind of know this a little bit better, which is coming next? Giants, supergiants, or white dwarf? Where's our sun going to go to next? Michael. Giant. Yes, this is where our sun will go next. It's intermediate stage. And if you look closely, you see all these dots here? 
this section of the chart is kind of showing you the stars that are making their way off the main sequence and becoming giants. So these stars are running out of hydrogen fuel, or maybe they have already, and they're starting to increase in size and luminosity as a result. So eventually they become part of the giant category of stars. So a star stays on the main sequence until it runs out of hydrogen, and then it becomes a giant. So what will happen to our sun next? Once it spends some time as a giant, what is the next category that it will go to? John Carlo. Okay. Not a super giant. Because our star is not big enough. Yep, it, we don't see a planetary nebula on here though. So it'll be the last stage of our sun. Oh, a white dwarf. This is the late stage. And so our sun is currently an early stage. It will then go to intermediate stage as the giants, and then finally end up as a white dwarf, which is our late stage. Okay. Where did being fast? Okay. What's up, Ruby? I have a question. Um, can you like imagine it's almost a low light, and then that's like your exit, and the sun is getting off? Yeah, so you can kind of think of it that way. Um, this is not a map of the night sky, though. There are stars plotted in a chart based on luminosity, size, and temperature. So as long as you understand that, you can use that thought. Okay, these stars are aging too much. They can't keep up, so they're getting off the exit. Now they're giant stars. Okay, now the, the planetary nebula followed by white dwarf. Notice there's no like movement of the stars this way. It's kind of more sudden. So they're here and then in seconds, the planetary nebula leaves the white dwarf behind and then they're here. So it's not the same kind of like slow exit. Okay, so this is the final stage of our, our sun. And I just want to draw your attention to these categories. All of these are stars, meaning they're performing fusion. Anything that's on here has to be an actual star. So there's no proto stars on here. There's no planetary nebulas. There's no nebulas because those aren't stars. The only thing that can be on this chart is something that which is performing fusion. So do you see any black dwarfs anywhere? No, because they're not performing fusion. They're not actual stars. We still call them stars because they're like a skeleton. So like a white dwarf would be like a living star, the skeleton is the black dwarf, so it is no longer alive, if that makes sense. Yeah? How did we manage to draw the shape of that star? Like the shape of the Like how did we make a star like look like this? Yeah. I guess because they kind of like, they twinkle in the night sky, so people may think it looks like that. They don't actually look like that, they look like this. <laughs> you know, it's just kind of like a circular object. Yeah? So does a black dwarf do anything, or is it just... It just sits there. It doesn't give off any light. The only way we know it's there is because it uh, things are still going around it, generally. There's some kind of gravitational pull on the objects around it. Did you have a question, Nick? The center of our galaxy is a black hole, do you think? So it must have been a super, super massive at one time, which is now dead. Yeah, which we're going to talk about large mass stars in a second. Yeah. Yeah, generally because the force of gravity wants to pull something inward, it's spinning too. So usually those, uh, uh, like the momentum, the movement of the star spinning, and the gravity pulling it inward, fusion outward causes a spherical shape. It may not be a perfect sphere, kind of like our Earth. It looks like a sphere, but technically maybe it's these are good questions, guys. Okay, so this is the stages of our sun. Early stage is the first stage, okay? It has just done being a protostar. It's a main sequence star. Then it starts to lose hydrogen fuel, dot off of the main sequence, and become a giant, stage two. Stage three, it outgasses planetary nebula. That's not on here, but what's left over is the white dwarf stage, which is the late stage. And it will stay on here until the white dwarf gets cold enough that it can perform fusion, and then it's a black dwarf, and then it's not on here anymore. 
So this is a typical low or medium mass star life cycle, which you can see here too, which is a cooler picture. So nebula, small star, red giant, planetary nebula, this is called the Eskimo Nebula for reasons which you could probably see. Looks also like a lion to me, maybe Gryffindor Nebula, and then white dwarf. Okay. So that's a small mass star. So now let's talk about uh, large mass stars. It's a little bit more violent. So a high mass star is a very similar, but not exactly the same, life cycle. A dying red supergiant star can suddenly explode. So highlights suddenly explode. The explosion is called a supernova. After the star explodes, some of the materials from the star are left behind. This material may form a neutron star. Neutron stars are the remains of high mass stars. But the most massive stars become black holes when they die. After a large mass star explodes, a large amount of mass may remain. The gravity of the mass is so strong that gas is pulled inward. So gravity is so strong. Gas is pulled inward, pouring, pulling more gas into a smaller and smaller space. Eventually the gravity becomes so strong that nothing can escape, not even light. And the life cycle of a star spans over billions of years. So this is not a short time frame, okay? So when you're looking at, uh, and we'll go back to the reference table for a second. When you're looking at a high mass star now, the really the only thing on here that's high mass star is a supergiant. After the supergiant phase, the star destroys itself. There's no neutron stars on here. There's no black holes. Um, there's no supernovas because the star is destroyed when those things happen. Following a supernova, it's really not a star anymore. It's not performing fusion. It's still giving off energy, but it's from uh, past fusion. It's like stuff it has saved up. So supergiant stars are the intermediate stage and there's no late stage for a supergiant. Okay, destruction is uh, pretty much what their end is. So if you look on this, Supergiant, this is your supernova, much larger explosion than a planetary nebula. And then you either get a neutron star, or if it's a really huge star, you get a black hole. Yeah? Samantha? So, do you know when the neutron star makes the whole bigger smaller of a supergiant? Yeah, so if the star that created the black hole that we think is at the center of our galaxy was a little smaller, then maybe it would have been a neutron star. Yeah. Okay, and so you can see this. Different picture, nebula, so this is a large um, main sequence star, balloons out to be a red supergiant, supernova, and then you have your neutron star or black hole. Okay, so this is a remnant of the supernova. Notice there's nothing really left at the core here. Okay, so in the planetary nebula, you can see the white dwarf in the center, that's there. There's really nothing left after the supernova. Stuff just starts to come back together and just either release energy out like the neutron star does or the black hole just consumes it. Do they know, out of curiosity, do they know um, star by star which stars will exactly become black holes or they don't really know that? No, I feel like they may they have know. an idea of the, the mass that you'd need at, at this phase for here here, but, but no exact maybe not exact. Exactly. Yeah, I don't know if they could say exactly for sure. Because there's other things that factor into it. Like if there's other stars nearby it right, that will right. contribute to that mass, then maybe you would get this. It's hard to say. I know say. kids are always very interested in black holes. Yeah, I know. I think everybody is. They are cool to think about. Yeah, thanks. So a neutron star is kind of like it's a, a ball of energy, and then you have light just kind of like jutting out. It almost looks like a lighthouse because it like flashes as it like rapidly rotates following this explosion. 
Um, and so if this is getting off like x-rays, gamma rays, they're super dangerous. And it kind of does like a rotation like this, where energy is just suddenly pulsing out in regular intervals. It's not so much pulling energy in like a black hole is, it's just like giving energy out. And eventually it'll run out of it, but you don't want to be around one of these, or one of these for that matter, but kind of different reasons. Yeah, you don't want to yeah. be yeah. I think we're far enough from it that it wouldn't be any question. Yes. When the sun eventually becomes like warp, will it vanish away from our slide like Jupiter and Mars? Um, that's a good question. So this stage would destroy all of the interior planets, probably even including Earth. Um, also, the planets that are around it may be kind of destroyed from the uh, the initial explosion of the planetary nebula out. It would probably destroy most of the atmospheres of the larger planets as well. So the less less damage would be the farther out planets like Neptune. Maybe they would be less affected. But also, white dwarfs have much less mass than this initial star. And so this white dwarf would have a harder time like holding on to the planets with their gravity. Jupiter and Saturn would start to drift away a little bit further away. Yeah, Nick. What is Jupiter? It's a planet with a rocky core surrounded by a huge atmosphere. It's what we call a gas giant planet. Yeah, some people call Jupiter a failed star, but Jupiter's not near big enough to be a star. So I don't really call it that, and hopefully we won't either. <laughs> Vocabulary. Try to practice some of these. See what you know first without flipping back. That's my suggestion for you. See which ones you're most comfortable with, and if you don't know it, before you flip back, put a little star next to it so you know that that's a word you might need to review tonight for your quiz. What's the question? Um, so just uh, gas is pulled inward. Gas is pulled inward. And then gravity becomes too strong and that one needs to be Thank you. 
see how you guys did. So what I would like you to do is that when I call on you, you pick one of the words, whichever one you want, we don't have to go in order, and tell me the definition that goes with it. Okay? So I ever, there's enough of these that I think everybody should be able to do one. So just wait for me to get to you. Yes. Okay, tell me which one you want to do. Black hole. Black hole. Okay, which one is that? Exerts. Uh, yeah, exerts such a strong gravitational pull that no light escapes. That is a black hole with F. Okay, good. Um, give me another one, Lily. Good, very nice. Okay, black hole, nuclear fusion, done. Uh, Ava. Good, perfect. Pretty cool, pretty big. Cole, another one? Okay, tell me what definition. Perfect, very nice. Um, Samantha, give me another one. Good, perfect. Okay, another one. Uh, Camden. Good, perfect. Okay, so not as big as a star that would create a black um, a black hole, but just almost as big. Uh, Madison, give me another one. Uh, supernova is G, which is a red supergiant star explodes. That is correct. Uh, Sarah, can you give me another one for either planetary nebula, black or white dwarf? Good, perfect. When the planetary nebula kind of gets shot out into space, the white dwarf is left as the core of that. Okay, give me another one. Black one? dwarf is K. Black dwarf is K. What a medium mass star becomes at the end of its life. Good, which means the last one, planetary nebula, is H. Okay, one more set of practice in this stuff, and I think we can do this together. So this first section, is looking at a life cycle of a low mass star. So these compare the stages and the names for these stages for a low mass versus high mass star. So each one of these stages is lettered and a description or the name for the stage is listed, okay? So let's look at A first. Okay, so it says gas and dust. Can someone tell me what number or the name represents A from this list? John Carlo? Nebula. Good. A is a nebula. All stars start out as a nebula. And then look at B, the birth of a star. So what has to happen for a star to be born? Samantha? Fusion. Yes, good. So B is two where fusion begins. After fusion has begun, we get a star that is um like our sun. So that's C. So, oh, I just gave that one to you. C is the stage our sun is in. Main sequence. What happens after the main sequence? What happens next? Lily? Red giant. Good, a red giant. That's D. Okay, so since this is a low mass star, what is E showing you? Looks like a little thing in the middle, followed by gas and dust around the outside. Good, that's the planetary nebula. Okay, and then we have F, which is kind of what's at the center of that planetary nebula. Yep, Madison? Good, a white dwarf. And then once that white dwarf no longer performs fusion, it is a black dwarf. Okay, so that is your life cycle of a low mass star. Questions on this? Let's just do a high mass star 
And then I feel like we missed something in your notes yesterday. We didn't finish all of it. So I want to go back to that before we do the lab. Okay. So section four, high mass star. We're going to do it the same way. So same idea. You see the steps are lettered here. And then they're numbered on the side. So let's look at A, gas and dust. Michael, what is this first step? Um, four. Good. Gravity causes this to condense into a protostar. So this is like pre-protostar. Okay. Next one, B. When a star is about to be born, what step should come next? Moon. Good. Spherical and extremely hot, but not quite hot enough for fusion to begin. C is just after fusion has started. So what kind of star is early in the star's life cycle, just after fusion has begun? Carolyn, what did you get for this one? What is C? It's the same stage our sun is in. Not sure? Okay, Madison? Main sequence star. That is the star our sun is in. Good. Okay. So the next step, D, comes after the main sequence. So something happens that makes the star leave the main sequence. Culture. Good. The star runs out of hydrogen and grows larger. So this is a uh, supergiant. Okay, now E. Both the same. Looks like a little explosion. Brody, what is E representing? Supernova. Good. That is our supernova. Okay. And now G is not quite as massive. It's just a little less massive. So which one is this? Camden? Good. G is a neutron star, which means F is the black hole. Okay. So that's, you have a nice comparison of the differences between a high versus low mass star life cycle. So before we do our lab, I want to just go back to a couple pages that we didn't get to yesterday, because I want to make sure you have all the the right answer. So I want to give you a little bit more practice using your reference table because you will be asked questions in lab using that reference table. So I believe we got up to question seven yesterday in class. So flip back to I think page one, two, three, four, five, six. I think page eight of your notes. And this is what we finished in class yesterday. So it's right before uh, what we started today. So it'll be the page right before this page. I don't think we did all the answers. So I want to just make sure we get all the answers. Here. Okay, so use your reference table and try some of these questions. I'm going to give you about two minutes to finish up these questions. And then I'll give you the homework for tonight. And I'll also give you the lab. I think we got most of these. I think we're going to start with seven. Yes, 
some of them may have finished at the end yesterday. Okay, so let's go over some of these questions so that you can uh, get started soon on the lab. So we're on question seven. Seven asks, what is the luminosity of 40 Eridani B? Does anyone think they can tell me what is the luminosity for that star? Camden? Good. Okay, so 40 Eridani B is just above the 0 0.01 line. If you wanted to, you can make little marks in where the, the halfway mark is. So the halfway mark between these two numbers would be 0 0.05. Okay, this would be 0 0.5. This would be 5. This would be 50. Okay, you get the idea. So the one, the 40 Ardani B is just above the 0 0.01 line. So I would say anything between this number and this number would be correct for that. But 0 0.02 I think is the best number. What is the luminosity of Deneb? So one of the super giant stars near the top, this guy. What is the luminosity of this star? What do you think? Nine seconds. I think that would be a good number. 700,000 is good. Um, I'm just going to put the halfway point so you can see it. This would be like 500,000. And it looks like Deneb is between 500,000 and a million. So anything between 600,000 to like even, uh, I'd say like 800,000 would be correct for this one. Okay, anything in that range is fine. Okay. Uh, which star on the chart is the largest? Michael, what do you think? Which is the largest star? Uh, yep, Deneb is the largest star on this chart. It's closest to the top. Good. Which star is the smallest? This one's kind of tricky because there's two that are pretty small, but one of them is a little bit closer to the bottom. So which star is the smallest star on the chart? What do you think? Samantha? Yeah, Procyon B is the smallest one. It is a little bit further down than Proximus and Tori. It's a little bit tinier. Not by much, though. Number 11. How is Alpha Centauri, which is this star, different than our sun? They're exactly the same in two ways and different in two ways. Yeah, Lily. Um, yeah, Alpha Centauri is a little bit bigger because it's above, and if it's a little bit bigger, it's also a little brighter. So it's different by size and luminosity. Okay. Is Procyon B considered to be an old star or a young star? What do you think, Brody? Procyon B is down here in the white dwarf section. So is that an old star or a young star? Look what it says under white dwarfs. So, good, an old star, very nice. I think of white dwarf stars as like little old people. They're white, they're small, they have like white hair, okay? So that's a white dwarf, a late stage star, it's old. Good. Um, which group would contain a star having a temperature of 35, uh, 3,500 and a luminosity of 1,200? Which section? Main sequence, giants, super giants, or uh, white dwarfs? Camden? Giants, good. Temperature of 3,500 would be about right here. Um, luminosity of 1,200 would be like right here. So that's right in the middle of the giants category. Okay, last one. Which stage of life is our sun currently in? John Carlo? Main sequence, which we can call the early stage. Perfect. Do you have any questions on using this page of the reference table or anything from the notes before we get started with lab? 
Okay, so I'm going to give you your homework for tonight first. If you finish your lab goals and you want to get started, you can, but I would do your lab stuff first so that you can make sure that you get that stuff done. It's a little bit harder. You will need colored pencils for labs. So you might want to take that out. You're going to need your reference paper. Before we get started on the lab, new lab, um, I updated the missing lab board as of yesterday. So if your name is on this board, next to what I told the lab that you were missing on Google. Um, if it's not on Google, it shouldn't be in the cabinet yet. It may still be in your binder, but locate it and then make sure it gets on Google because otherwise the grade can't be that high if you're missing a lab if it's a zero. And it doesn't have to stay a zero, but you just have to make sure you're handing it in. So that's there for anyone that needs to see it. Um, make sure your labs are going in the bin after you put them on Google. Yeah. Oh, did I not give you one? Mr. Maguire, can you send this back to me? Okay, so colored pencils should be out. And I will give you the bowls for this lab so that you can see what you will be doing. Before we get started, please copy down the number of the lab. This is lab eight. And the due date is 11-2 on Google Classroom. So that's Monday. So fill in lab eight, and it's due on 11-2. Especially if you find that you have a hard time remembering if you put the lab on Google or not, or when it's due on Google, make sure you copy down the due date. I can't do that for you, and I can't force you to do it. But if you notice you keep missing labs and you're handing things in late, make sure the due date's on there. That will help you out a lot. Okay, so your goals this period are to read and highlight the introduction, kind of like we did in class today, so just highlight important information. You could just underline also if you want to. And you're going to complete uh, part of the procedure. Okay, so I'm going to show you the procedure here. Two period lab. Two period lab, yep. So this is what you're going to start with. You're going to color the star box based on its surface temperature using your reference table. So I'm going to give you an example of how to do that. So the first star is Orion. It is a temperature of 20,000 Kelvin. So I'm going to go to my reference table, find a temperature of 20,000 Kelvin, and see that it's between the color blue and blue white. So I'm going to go to my lab and I'm going to color in the star box a bluish whitish color. Okay? Just as I showed you. Number two, Polaris has a surface temperature of 5,900 Kelvin. So if you go to your reference table, Find 5,900, which is right before 6,000. That's a yellow color. So you'll go to the lab and just shade in the box in yellow. And you're going to do that for the rest of those 18. 
Okay. I'm gonna show you the last part of the goal, so we're all on the same page. So just watch me for a second. These two things, you do not have to finish. Okay, maybe get through half of them, or maybe you can just start these. Okay, we're not having a full period for this lab today, so I'm not gonna make you finish the entire procedure. I'm gonna show you how to do the first two on the next page so that when you get to it, you don't need me to go through it again. So just make sure you're listening. The coloring part is the easy part. This is a bit harder, okay? So you're gonna plot the stars listed below on the graph on the next page. And then you're gonna write the number next to each star plotted. So you'll have a dot plus the number. So Orion has a luminosity of 10,000 and a surface temperature of 20,000. So you're gonna go to this graph Okay, and you're going to find a luminosity of 10,000 and a surface temperature of 20,000. So the surface temperatures are at the bottom, and instead of writing 20,000, they just write 20, okay? So this is the 20,000 line. I'm just going to trace it. You don't need to do this. I'm just doing it on mine, okay? And then you're going to find the luminosity of 20,000. Uh, sorry, 10,000. So here's 1,000, here's 10,000, that's what this line is. And so when, where these two lines touch is right here. So this will be my first dot, and I'm going to label it 1. Now just a little note on how these, uh, the y-axis is counting. So this is 1,000, this is 2,000, 4,000, this would be 6,000, and this line would be 8,000 and then you have 10,000. So it goes 1, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. Okay, so it's the one is the only odd number in there. It's a weird graph. Okay, but just so you know, these two little lines that are close are counting by twos. Yes, I know. Is treating this the same way we did with the profile? Yeah, like an overlay. Yep, yeah. yeah, exactly. I don't have it with me today, but next time I'll check them. Okay, I'll do Polaris with you too. So Polaris is our second point. It has a surface temperature of 5,900. So 5,900 is right before the six. And then a luminosity of only six. So not very luminous Polaris. That's why you can't really see it that well in the night sky. So this is one, this is two, four, six, eight. So this is six, this is the line we want. I'm just going to follow this across until I get to 59, right here is my two. And I'll zoom back out again so you can see it a little bit better. Okay. And so you're going to do this with all 18. Again, you don't need to finish this plotting. Take your time with this. I don't want you to rush. You'll solve another whole period to do this. And then you just have a couple questions to answer, only nine questions after that. So it's not a long lab. You're only going by the temperature, so you don't need the actual star. Goals back up too, so you can see. Hold on one second. Uh, 
Oh, no, that's not true. 